G'day everyone. Are you passionate about fish care or concerned with, with conserving the fantastic fishing that we have now for future generations to come? Because if you are, then make sure you stay tuned to this video because not only am I going to give you my top five tips for practicing great fish handling to ensure good catch and release survival rates, but I'm also going to be pointing out a few other odds and ends, how it's okay to keep a fish from time to time for a feed and not feel guilty about it the best ways to handle the fish, pretty much everything you need to know to make sure that your fish swim away safely and can be enjoyed by other anglers down the line is gonna be contained in this video. Righty -o, folks. First, I'm gonna start off with my top five tips for fish handling. But at the end, I'm just going to have a bit of a general chat about the importance of a certain few aspects of fish handling. Let's get straight down to it. Number one. Righty everyone, my number one tip for fish handling is not keeping the fish out of the water for too long. Minimising the time you keep the fish out of the water. I look at social media and I see people saying, support the stomach, do this, wet your hands, blah, blah, blah. But rarely do I ever see anybody question, how long was the fish left out of water? Now, this, this is important for all species of fish, but some more than others. Some, some of the more hardy species like Murray cod, carp, they can be kept out of the water for a lot longer than what a trout can, particularly in summer. You go trout fishing this time of year, you might only have 20, or sec 20 seconds or so to get it out of the water, get a quick photo and put it back. Sometimes you've got to wonder whether it's worth getting a quick photo because they die so quickly. But even with the more hardy species like Murray Cod and Ken Carp and even Golden Perch here in Australia, they, even though they can be kept out longer, they shouldn't. It's not good for them, plain and simple. You need to minimise the amount of time you have that fish out of the water. And there's a few ways to do that. Say you're in a boat, you've got a nice Murray Cod and you want to hold it up for a photo, leave it in the net. Scoop it up with your landing net, or land it with your landing net, but then just leave it in the net in the water while you get your brag mat ready, ready if you want to weigh it, while you take your, you'll measure it, sorry, while you take your lens off your camera, while you get everything organised, leave the fish in the water, leave it in the landing net. If you've got someone with you, let them hold the net. Even if you have to use fish grips which aren't as good as a landing net, but it's still a better option than leaving it on the floor of the boat in the sun. So leave the fish in the water. Do everything you can to leave the fish in the water while you get organised with your photographic gear or your tape measures and stuff like that. Rightio folks, tip number two is to always wet your hands. Fish are slimy. Some fish are slimier than others, but nearly all fish are slimy. That slime is like a barrier cream for the fish. That's like its immune system, that's its protection. That slime protects the fish from getting an infection, from picking up fish diseases. That is very important for the overall health of the fish to maintain that slime. Now, when you catch a fish, the best way to protect that slime is by wetting your hand before you hold the fish. If you just get a dry hand and hold the fish up, your dry hand, and it'll be warm because we're 37 degrees on average, your dry warm hand is most likely going to damage that fish's slime. Now that doesn't automatically mean the fish is going to see harm. It doesn't mean it's going to die or pick up an infection. It just means it's going to be more prone to infection. So if you damage that fish's slime, then put it back in the water, then it rubs up against a fish with some sort of fish herpes virus or, or some other sort of fish disease, it's going to be more likely to pick that up because of the damaged slime. So we need to ensure that we, we protect the fish's slime, and the best way to do that is to always wet your hands when you land a fish. And if you want to lay your fish on a brag mat and measure it, wet the brag mat. If you want to pick it up for a photo, wet your hands. Before you, well, obviously you've got to wet your landing net when you land it, but wherever possible, always try and handle the fish with wet hands or laid on a wet surface. A cool wet surface is better. Actually, a lot of the fishing I do, the Murray Cod fishing around here, in the heat of the summer, is on sandbars and muddy flats. When I land a fish, quite often I'll, land it on the, I'll lay it on the damp sand on the edge of the water or the damp, cool mud with a bit of green grass around the edge of the water. That's a far better option than putting it on the hot, dry ground with the dry grass and the dead gum leaves because that will damage the fish. Look for a nice, cool, damp bit of ground close to the water's edge if you need to land the fish. Now that leads me to tip number three 
is that you should always support the fish by the stomach. You see the olden day photos of people holding fish up by the mouth. Or even these days, you see a lot of people will still put the fish grips in the fish's mouth and hold the fish up by the fish grips. That's not really good for the fish. In fact, it's very bad for the fish because it can sever the, 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 the nerves in their neck, pretty much hang the fish. You're hanging the fish. So where possible, it's always important to put your hands under the fish's stomach and support the weight evenly across both hands just so that you pretty much don't handle the, don't, don't hang the fish. This is, in my opinion, and a lot of people argue this point, but in my opinion, I think it's far more important with bigger fish, particularly really big, heavy fish that are far more prone because they've got a lot more weight pulling on the nerves on their neck. But in saying that, smaller fish, even though there's less weight, they have smaller nerves. So you still got the same weight to nerve ratio, I suppose you could say. I think it's more important with bigger fish to, to support them by the stomach. But it's a good habit to get into no matter what the size of the fish is. Particularly with Murray Cod. If you're fishing for Murray Cod, which you've got a great big head and can be quite big around the chest sort of area. I think it's, in, even with the little fish, if you can, it's important to get into a good habit of supporting them by the stomach for any sort of photographs that you want to get, you want to have taken. Bigger fish, it's imperative. You really, really need to do it. And I'll admit, if I'm out the river fishing somewhere and I catch a fish that I think is close to 100 centimetres and it's big, if I can't land that fish properly, I will most likely get a photo of it in the water, reach my plies in and unhook it. If I'm on a sandbar where I'm wading in the water and I can quite comfortably get my arms under the fish and lift it up for a photo, then I'll do that and I'll get my photo because the photo is the trophy. Years ago, the head on the wall was the trophy and the body went to the table. These days, the photo is the trophy and it's all about the photo. But for me, I want to know that I can, I can land that fish by the stomach without having to drag it up by the mouth before I get the photo. If I can't, I'll just get the photo of it in the water and then hope that next time I catch a big one, I'm standing on a sandbar so that I can support it properly. So it's always good to support the fish by the stomach. It's more important with the bigger fish, but it's, much, it's a great habit to get into if you do it with the small fish now as well. And in this day and age, Photos of cod being held up by fish grips like that or held up by pliers or even just held up with the thumb in the mouth grip. Photos of fish, particularly native fish like Murray cod and yellow belly, photos of fish being supported by their mouth are becoming more and more unloved, more and more controversial. <laughs> and, and if you share photos of yourself holding fish up by the fish grips like that on social media, you're probably going to get torn to bits these days because a lot of people don't like it because they realise the detrimental effects that it has on the fish. So where possible, try and support the fish by the stomach, support its weight evenly, and with larger fish, that is critical. There's a couple of things worth noting in this video. One, why I'm getting my camera gear ready, I'm putting it on, the, on a tree, I'm getting the tripod, for the timer ready and everything, I'm leaving the fish in the water. And I actually say, if the fish gets off, I don't care, because it's as good as caught. But I, I will get a photo if I can. If my priorities were the other way around and I must get the photo, then I'll hold the fish out of the water for all that time while I get the camera ready or lay it on the sand, the fish is more likely to die when I release it. So I leave the fish in the water while I stuff around getting organised. I then I wet my hands before I hold it and I lift it up by the stomach and I cover the things that I've just spoken about. So watch this, this short clip before I go to number four, because I think this is quite a good demonstration on, on respecting fish and handling Camera properly. Out to get a good photo, and I'm doing that now while the fish is in the water. I'm not worried about losing the fish. As far as I'm concerned, that's as good as caught. So I'd rather leave that in the water where it's comfortable while I set this good camera up on this tree here. I'm put it in auto. I'm going to put the timer on. Right, that's working. I'll set that on. I might even fold the little flip screen out so I can see whether I'm in the frame properly. How good's that? I don't care if it's a bit crooked. Wow, this fish is going for a swim. Happy fish. He'll be happy when I put him back. This is one of the biggest problems with fishing alone. If I move all this crap, I reckon I should be able to stand down in front and get me photo. Righto, fishy. Time for landing. My phone's in my bag and it's ringing. This is a great fish. 
Oh, my knee. I can barely even get down to the water because of my knee. Now, with fish this size, it's more important to really lift it up by its stomach like that than it is with the smaller fish. I'm going to push that. I hope that I get this on photo. Oh shit, took four photos. Righty-o folks. I've just got a couple of photos. I'm putting him back in the water. I'm going to use my pliers now. I'm going to use my pliers now to take the, the lure out of the fish's mouth. I've got a bit of a tangle here. So I'm going to leave the fish in the water while I untangle it. Right over, we're untangled, he's ready to go. I just quickly want to point something out to you. This fish is probably in the high 60 centimetres. It's, apart from that 85 centimetre cod I got back in December, he's the biggest cod I've caught all season. He would be nudging 70 centimetres. But look at his mouth. See the damage? He has been caught before. He is a lovely fish, but he has been caught before. And that really highlights... There you go, buddy. He is gone. That really shows me just how effective catch and release fishing practices are. That's a good eight or nine pound cod. And he is gone. He has been caught before. Had the last person kept that fish, then I wouldn't have just caught it right now. Tip number four is swimming the fish. You see a lot of people put them in the water and move them backwards and forwards before they release them and stuff like that. I think swimming fish is something that's very, very variable. There's a lot of variables. The air temperature can be a variable because the hot days can have more of a detrimental effect on the fish. The line weight that you're using can be, can be one of the variables. Because if you're using heavy line and you get the fish straight in, there's no real need to swim it. The water temperature can be a variable. So here's a couple of things to consider. A lot of my fishing, you'll notice I don't swim the fish. I might get a quick photo where I hold it up for my video camera, unhook it and put it back, and I just let it swim straight away. And the reason I can do this is because I use 50 pound line. Not long ago, I had an internet troll comment on one of my older YouTube videos and say, this bloke doesn't worry about fighting the fish, he just winches them in. And that guy was right. He probably thought he was gonna annoy me, but I think that's a good thing that I do that because by using 50 pound line, I can just, even with little fish that are only two or three pounds, I can get them straight in, unhook them, and put them back. Because I haven't had to fight for too much. Now, most of us that have caught a few Murray Cod know that Murray Cod are known as a poor fighting fish species. Now, I know someone's going to comment and say they caught 130 centimetres and have fought really well. Big fish do fight well, there's no doubt about that. But pound for pound, a Murray Cod, you know, 40 or 50 centimetres long, isn't going to fight anywhere near as much as a trout or a carp or something of similar size. With Murray Cod fishing, the excitement is all in the strike, the hard, aggressive strike of a lure, the boof of a surface lure, and the, the, the challenge is to find the fish. So once you've, you've got your strike, you've got your fish on, you've had all your fun, you've found it, you've found where it is, now you just want to reel it in as quick as you can and get a photo. So by using heavy line, that fish doesn't have to fight for too long. When a fish fights, it builds up lactic acid in its system, and that's what stresses the fish out and causes all kinds of problems. The more the fish fight, the more they need to swim away or be swam when you put them back in the water. Heavy line, little fish, unclip them and put them back. If you've got a big fish that you've been fighting for a while and it's very worn out, they're the ones that you need to swim. They're the ones that need to get their balance. And that goes with trout as well. Even when I'm trout fishing, if I've had a reasonable sized trout on and it's put up quite a good fight, when I release it, quite often I'll swim them or at least hold them in the current until they get their balance right and their pectoral fins start swimming and I know that they can swim off nice and slowly. But smaller fish, I'll just unhook and throw back because they haven't had that fight. They haven't worn themselves out as much. So swimming fish is good, but it's really only required for fish that are stressed, that have had a big fight and have stressed out in the battle. And it's more important with bigger fish because naturally bigger fish become a lot more stressed because they do fight a lot harder. Now, when you swim the fish, don't pull them backwards. There's no need to pull fish backwards, particularly Murray Cod, because they don't swim backwards in the water. The water their gills aren't designed for water to go back through. 
the gills face that way and they're designed for the water to go in the mouth and out their gills. So you need to swim them forward. If you're on a boat, you can drive around in circles. If you're on a sandbar, you can just walk forward with it a little bit. But moving it backwards and forwards like this in the water gets the water going unnaturally through its gills. And I don't think that's a great thing. So swimming fish, swim them if they're stressed. Always swim them forward. And remember, in a lot of these waters, particularly this time of year when it's really hot, the water down deeper is cooler. The water on top is quite warm. And sometimes, if that fish isn't too stressed, I think the best thing to do is literally spear it back into the water. Drop it in head first from two or three feet above the water. I know a few people will argue with this, but I think it's good because it pushes the fish through that warm layer and down where the pressure is different, the water is cooler, it's darker and they feel safer, which straight away leads to less stress on the fish. Now, tip number five probably isn't about fish handling, it's about keeping a feed of fish. And this is, the tip is that it's okay to keep a feed of fish. I notice on social media these days, people get frowned upon more and more these days if they hit one on the head and take it home for the table. I don't think that's good. I think it's all about being conservative, not keeping too many. There's an old saying, limit your kill, don't kill your limit. And that's fine. I haven't kept a Murray Cod for probably three or four years now. I think I might keep one later this year, but I might get into Lake Mulwala where there's quite a few around that sort of 55 to 60 centimetre size. And I might keep one just to keep my eye in pretty much. Somewhere like Lake Eildon that gets stocked very heavily with cod is a great spot to keep a feed of Murray Cod if you get one in that 55 to 75 centimetre size. It's the same as trout. I won't keep a trout out of a trout stream because the trout streams aren't stocked these days. They struggle with the, everything warming up and the, the water levels aren't what they used to be. The conditions are marginal at best. So I would rather keep a trout from a big lake like Lake William Hovel or Lake Dartmouth or somewhere like that. But it's all about knowing where, when, and to limit yourself. There's no need to keep every legal fish that you catch, but you shouldn't feel guilty about keeping one for a feed from time to time either. I don't think it is advisable to turn any of our fish species into catch and release only. I think that just looks, in the eyes of the greenies, it looks as though we're just targeting them purely for humiliation, purely to put the fish through torture. It's a God-given right for us to eat fish. We're fish eaters. We're omnivores. We eat fish and vegetables. But it's our God-given right to be able to keep and eat a feed of fish. And we don't want to lose that right. So I think it's more important than we focus on limiting how many we keep, not overdoing it. Are you in a spot that can sustain a couple of fish coming out of for, for the table? Because there is, it is quite enjoyable to have a feed of fresh fish, whether it's Murray Cod, Golden Perch, Redfin, Trout, or, or anything else. It's quite enjoyable to harvest and eat a fish that you've caught yourself. But it's all about limiting how many you catch to ensure that the waterways maintain a healthy population of fish for future generations. Rightio folks, it's just a couple of things I wanted to touch on at the end here. One of them I've already sort of touched on, and that is the importance of using decent sized line. There's no point going out with 10 pound line and targeting big Murray Cod just so that you can have a big long fight with a fish and say it put up a great fight on light gear because you will stress the fish out, you'll build up the lactic acid in the fish's system and the fish will, will struggle to survive and could very well die. I use 50 pound braid when I'm Murray cod fishing because the heavy braid doesn't hinder my lure's performance, it doesn't hinder the way my lure swims and it doesn't hinder my casting distance. So I can get away with it, so I do use it. It's good in the sense that I can get all my lures back out of the trees and off the snags, but it's also good in the sense that the fish aren't fighting for 10 minutes. Even a, my biggest cod was 98 centimetres and I landed it in about two minutes using 50 pound line because the heavy line just enabled me to get the fish in quick. By getting the fish in quick, it means the fish has got more chance of swimming off. If the fish has to struggle and really fight and be stressed out for a significant amount of time, there's less chance the fish will swim off and more chance that it might die. So don't be afraid to use heavier line. Use the heaviest line you can get away with. And the other thing I wanted to talk about is fish grips. I use the steel fish grips. They're like, originally they came out called Boga grips. I think Boga was the name of the manufacturer. They're convenient, but they're not the greatest. Basically back when I was a young bloke, back in the 80s, going out with my dad and my uncles and grandparents, we landed our cod with a gaff hook. <laughs> At some point during the 1980s, we took a big step forward and went from the gaff hook to a landing net. 
And then during the late 90s and early 2000s, we started, I'd done away with the landing net and started using the fish grips, which I still do. But now there's better things out. There's the plastic fish grips, the fish grip, they're quite good for the, they're better for the fish's mouth than the steel ones that I use. And these days, we're seeing an increase in the amount of people using gloves because gloves are much, much better on the fish's mouth. And you can find gloves. There's a guy on Facebook named Sam Consolo. Sam is the administrator of the Facebook group Murray Cod Fishing. Go on Facebook, look up the page or the group Murray Cod Fishing, and you should be able to find Sam on there somewhere. And Sam actually sells decent gloves for fish handling purposes, and they are the way forward, and they're better than the steel grips that I use. Some people don't like them, but for me they're convenient, so I'll be using them for quite a while yet, and one day I might just move on to the fish grip. I hope this has helped. I hope this has given you a bit of an insight into the best practices for fish handling so that we can have plenty of fish in the future for when my kids grow up and then their kids after that.